السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حيا على الصلاة حيا على الصلاة حيا على الفلاح حيا على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجال كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد Brothers and sisters in Islam الحمد لله we have arrived at the last 10 nights of Ramadan, the 10 most blessed nights of the year. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by these nights in the Quran, as he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wal-Fajr, swearing by the break of dawn. And by the ten nights. Some scholars say that this means the first ten days of Dhu Hijjah. And other scholars say that it means the last ten nights of Ramadan. The ten most blessed nights in the entire year. During these last ten nights, there is a goal that we are seeking. Just like we, there is a goal that we seek when we fast in the month of Ramadan. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated that goal very clearly for us in the Quran when he said, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, kutiba alaykum usiyam, kama kutiba ala ladhina min qablikum, la'allakum tattakun. O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed for you, as it was prescribed for those who came before you, so that perhaps you may attain taqwa. The overall goal of fasting is not to lose weight. The overall goal of fasting is not for some subsidiary matter that we conjure up in our minds. The overall goal of fasting as stated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that perhaps you may attain taqwa. You may attain taqwa. That is the goal behind fasting. In the, once we arrive at the last 10 nights of Ramadan, there is a goal that we are trying to achieve even further. Within the framework of fasting, 
There is another goal that we are trying to achieve in the last 10 nights of Ramadan, and that is to be found Laylatul Qadr, Iman in Wahti Sabin, to be found Laylatul uh, Qadr, believing in Allah, worshipping Allah, desiring our, desiring our reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the authority of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhum, who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِنَّ هَذَا الشَّهْرَ قَدْ حَضَرَكُمْ فِيهِ لَيْلَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٌ مَنْ حُرِمَهَا فَقَدْ حُرِمَ الْخَيْرِ كُلَّهُ مَنْ حُرِمَهَا فَقَدْ حُرِمَ خَيْرِ كُلَّهُ وَمَا وَمَا يُحْرَمْ خَيْرُهَا إِلَّا الْمَحْرُومُ that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that in هذا الشهر قد حضركم that this month of Ramadan is now present upon you. And in this month of Ramadan, there is a night, Laylatun. There is a night in this month, Khairu min alfi shahr, that is more virtuous than a thousand months, which is a total of 83 years and a few months. One night equivalent to worship in one night equivalent to 83 years and some odd months. A, a time frame, a window that most of us are not even going to live. That's the reality of it. The reality is that most of us are not going to live to 80 years old. The Prophet Sallallahu himself did not live to 83 years old. The Prophet Sallallahu died at 63 years old. Abu Bakr Radiallahu the best of this Ummah after the Prophet Sallallahu did not make it to 83 years old. He died uh, at 63 years old. Umar Radiallahu the best of this Ummah after the Prophet Sallallahu and Abu Bakr never made it to 83 years old. He died just as his Prophet, just as his predecessors, the Prophet Sallallahu and Abu Bakr at 63 years old. And these were the three greatest men of our ummah. And they didn't even make it to 63 years old. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, A'mar ummati bayna sitin wa sabi'een wa qareenu ma yujizu dhalik. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, The average age of my ummah, the average age of my nation is between 60 and 70 years old. Wa qareenu ma yujizu dhalik. And only a few will go beyond 70 years old. Only a few will make it beyond 70. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who actually conveyed that hadith to us, he himself did not make it past 70. He himself did not even make it to 65. Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. And he was the one who conveyed that information to us. So a period of 83 years and 3 months and some odd days. Laylatul Qadr Khayru Min Alfi Shahr. This one night in the month of Ramadan is more virtuous and better than a period of 83 years and a few months. A period of time that most of us will not make it to. It would behoove you as a Muslim to do your due diligence within these 10 days to seek out Laylatul Qadr and be found engaging in some form of worship, some form of ibadah. Continuing with the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Inna had the shahr qad hadarakum, that this month has come upon you. Fihi laylatun khayru min alfi shahr. In this month there is a night that is better than a thousand months. Wa min hurimaha faqad hurim al khayr kullahu. And whoever has been deprived of this night has been deprived of all good. If you are going to miss out on an opportunity to worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, for 83 plus years, 83 years and three months, if you're going to miss out on an opportunity to get that type of reward, then there is no good in you. <laughs> you are just lady, lazy, you are beyond mediocre. <laughs> you are less than mediocre. Because here is an opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is extending to us, and we would rather be up watching TV, we would rather be asleep, we would rather be engaged in some form of haram, Rather than seeking out Laylatul Qadr in hopes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would write you to be from amongst a najiheen of those who will be successful for the next coming year. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will write you to be from amongst a siha, those who are healthy and those who have their health for the next year. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will write you to be from amongst those who are salihun, those who are righteous for the next year. Rather than taking advantage of that, we would rather be asleep or engaged in some frivolous act that will reap no benefit for us at all. So the Prophet وسلم, said, Man khayraha, fa, fa, fa man, fa man khayraha, 
that whoever is deprived of the good that is in this night, then he is deprived of all good. وَمَا يُحْرَمْ خَيْرُهَا إِلَّا الْمَحْرُومِ And no one is deprived of the good in this night except someone who is deprived of all good. There's no good in you. And the regimen of the Prophet ﷺ, which we are going to explore today in this khutbah, we want to look at the regimen of the Prophet ﷺ uh, during these last 10 nights. Let's look to take a glimpse at the life of the Prophet ﷺ during these last 10 nights so we can use that as a blueprint for us. We can use that as the script for us that we can follow. Maybe we can't do all of it. But at least we have an idea of what the Prophet ﷺ, what his worship, what his nights used to look like during the last 10 nights of Ramadan. For those who are so interested. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, there's none that could give us an accurate description of the nights of the Prophet sallallahu during these times except the women who spent their nights with him. There's nobody who can give us a more accurate description of the nights of the Prophet sallallahu than the women he spent his nights with and that, those were his wives. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha given us a glimpse, a small window into the nights of the Prophet sallallahu during these last 10 nights of Ramadan. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذَا دَخَلَ الْعَشْرَ أَحْيَا اللَّيْلَ وَأَيْقَضَ أَهْلَ وَالشَّدَّ مِئْ زَرَهُ Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said that when the last ten nights of Ramadan came in, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ahya laylahu, that he would spend his whole night up. He would be up all night engaged in worship. Ahya laylahu, meaning his whole night, he gave life to his nights. If we had to translate that literally, if we had to translate that literal, it would mean ahya laylahu, he gave life to his nights. Nights are usually spent sleeping, but he would be up at night. He would give life to his nights. She said, And he would wake his family up. This was family time. This wasn't him getting out of sliding out of the bed, getting up worshiping all by himself while the rest of his family is asleep. This is a man who was concerned with getting his family up to engage in the same level of worship. Some of our families might be angry, upset. Our wives, husbands might be upset because we get them up at night for worship. Meanwhile, I'm trying to save you from the hellfire. Meanwhile, I'm trying to invite you to all that is good. And you're finding fault with me for getting you up. You're finding fault for me turning off the TV and telling us, let's engage in some form of ibadah. He woke his family up. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described another prophet in the Quran, كَانَ يَأْمُرُ أَهْلَهُ بِالصَّلَاءِ وَالزَّكَاةَ وَكَانَ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ مَرْضِيَّةِ Ismail, Prophet Ismail, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he used to enjoin upon his family salat and enjoin upon his family zakat. وَكَانَ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ مَرْضِيَّةِ And as a result of that, he was مَرْضِيَّةِ He was beloved, he was pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is pleased with you when you get your family up, when you encourage your family to do good. But the Prophet sallallahu كَانَ أَحْيَا لَيْلَهُ He would give night, he would give life to his nights. وَأَيْقَضَ أَهْلَهُ And he would wake his family up. وَشَدَّ مِئْزَرَهُ And some of the scholars, they interpret this to mean one of two things. Either it means that he would eat less. شِدَّ مِئْزَرَهُ He would tie his belt tighter around his waist. Meaning he would either eat less so that he can engage in more ibadah. Because many of us, we drop the ball. After Maghrib, we go, we eat, we stuff ourselves, and then we can barely pray Isha, and we definitely don't pray Tarawih. When you deprive yourself of food, you're giving yourself more spiritual energy. But when you fill yourself with food, physical food, you're taking away from your spiritual energy. Have we not figured that out? So after Maghrib, we go, we scarf down a whole bunch of food because we feel like we've been deprived all day long. You leaving all food and drink is not you depriving yourself. That's not a deprivation. That's a purification. You are purifying yourself spiritually, mentally, physically. You're allowing your body to detox, allowing your mind to detox. This is not, you know, I, I'm, you know, depriving myself so once I break my fast, I'm going to go... Stuff myself with a whole bunch of food. You are defeating the purpose. The purpose is not for deprivation. The purpose is for purification. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he does not wish upon you difficulty, but he only wishes for you ease. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ لَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ الْيُسْرَ وَلَكِنْ يُرِيدُ لَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ الْعُسْرَ وَيُرِيدُ بِكُمْ الْيُسْرَ وَلِتُكْمِنُ الْعِدَّةِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not wish for you difficulty. He only wants ease for you and that you complete the time that has been allotted for you. وَلِتُكْمِنُ الْعِدَّةِ So that you complete your term. وَلِتُكَبِّرُ اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا هَدَاكُمْ And that you praise Allah at the end of it, meaning on the day of the Eid. On the day of the Eid, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Wa lillahi alham. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of our period. But the Prophet sallallahu would get up at night, he would wake up his family, and he would engage, he would shed the mi'zarahu, he would tighten his belt, meaning he would eat less. And some scholars say that this means that he would refrain from sexual relations with his wives. He would refrain from sexual relations with his wives. In another hadith, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, she said, كَانَ نَبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَجْتَهِدُ فِي الْعَشْرَ الْأَوَاخِرِ مِنْ رَمَضَانِ مَا لَا يَجْتَهِدْ فِي غَيْرِهَا that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be more diligent in the last 10 nights of Ramadan in his ibadah, in his worship, unlike he would be in any other time in Ramadan. Meaning he would exert himself, he would push himself to the limit. Push yourself to the limit. Many of us, we do the bare minimum. We don't like pushing ourselves. We do the bare minimum. And then we get up and, you know, alhamdulillah, Ramadan was great, mashallah, this is the best Ramadan I had. Man, you did the same thing this Ramadan you did last Ramadan. Push yourself. Stop settling for mediocrity. Push yourself to do more. Push yourself to your limit. The Prophet used to get up at night and pray until his feet would bleed. Aisha asked him, why do you do this when Allah has forgiven you for your sins? Past and present. And his only response to Aisha was, Afala akunu abdin shakura. Should I not be a grateful servant? Should I not push myself to the limit because of the bounty and because of the virtue that God has given me? Should I do less or should I do more? Look at the blessing that Allah has given us. Most of us are not at work or we're working from home. Look at the blessing that you have. How many years of our lives have we been complaining that we would like to have off during Ramadan, that we would like to take off during Ramadan, and now here you have it. Here you have it. Here you have it. Many of us as teachers, we like to, you know, last year, teachers complaining, why can't we have the last 10 nights of Ramadan off? And here you are, off for the whole month of Ramadan. Such a blessing. Such a blessing. But we're still doing the same mediocre work, worship. We're still engaged in the same level of mediocrity as it relates to our ibadah. And the Prophet ﷺ, he would encourage the believers to do the same thing in Ramadan, especially in the last 10 nights. As Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, again, she said, Anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana yuraghib nas في قيام رمضان يعني عشر الأواخر من رمضان من غير أن يأمرهم بعزيمة أمر من غير أن يأمرهم بالعزيمة أمرهم فيه فيقول عليه الصلاة والسلام من قام رمضان إيمانا واحتسابا غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها she said that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that he used to كان يرغب الناس he would encourage the people he would inspire the people. He would inspire the people during the last ten nights of Ramadan, min ghayri and yet murohum bi azima, without imposing on them, right? Without shaming them, without blaming them, without making it wajib, without telling them anything specific to do. Just get up and worship. Get up and engage in some form of worship, whether that worship is ibad or whether that worship is dua. You get up at night and you're just making dua. You don't have to pray. You can get up and make dua. You can get up and read Quran. You can get up and listen to Quran and ponder and reflect. You have YouTube on your TV. You can turn on the YouTube where you can listen to the Quran and then read the words at the bottom, pondering and reflecting on the Quran as you hear it. You can get up and make dhikr. You can get up and read books. As some of the scholars uh, you know, said that you know, seeking knowledge was more virtuous 
To many of the scholars, seeking knowledge was more virtuous than supererogatory prayers. Imam Ahmed Rahimahullah Ta'ala and other scholars from Baghdad, they said that إِذَا جَاءَنَا أَبُوْ زُرْعَ al-Razi, When Abu Zur'a al-Razi, Shaykh al-Shuyukh al-Hadith, he was a scholar of the scholars of Hadith. Abu Zur'a al-Razi, when Abu Zur'a al-Razi would go visit Baghdad, Ahmed and many of the other scholars said that we would stop praying Qiyam layl we would stop praying at night to go sit with Abu Zur'a al-Razi for the time that he was in Baghdad. We would give up Qiyam layl we would stop praying to Hajjah, we would stop praying the night prayer to go sit with Abu Zur'a al-Razi and learn from him and absorb from him because many of the scholars saw that seeking knowledge was better, was better than supererogatory acts of worship. It's all, it, all, it all boils down to what does your heart find its niche in? What is your heart mostly affected by? As one of the scholars came to, uh, I believe it was Ibn Taymiyyah and asked, which is, which is better? Should I make dhikr or should I you know, uh, make istighfar? Meaning, should I say subhanallah or should I say astaghfirullah? And Imam Ahmed, he responded, uh, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah responded, either can a thobe nadifan, if the thobe is clean, if the thawb is clean, for al wirdu wal bukhur khayrun lahu. If the thawb is already clean, then just a good fragrance will do. He said, like in it can a thawb wasikhan, but if your thawb is dirty, for ma al har wa sabun khayrun lahu, then hot water and soap is better for it. Meaning, if you are already engaged in sin, then it would probably be better for you to make istighfar, ask Allah for forgiveness. But if you are clean, nadif, if you, you, know, you don't live a life of sin, then it would probably be better for you to say subhanallah, tasbih, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, because you don't have a whole bunch of sins to atone for. Subhanallah, so wise. You got to find what's your niche, what is easy, what do you find that your heart is mostly motivated by. Some people pray and their hearts are not motivated by the prayer. They don't understand what they're saying. They don't understand what they're reciting from the Quran. They go through the movements mechanically. So the, they're not really motivated. But when they make dua, they find that their hearts are there. When they read the Quran, they find that their hearts are there. There's some people who read Quran and can find that their hearts are motivated with reading the Quran than it is through Salah. And then there's some people who when they say Allahu Akbar and they go into their prayer, they forget about the world and everything in it. As Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, كَانَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ يُلَاعِبُنَا لَكِنْ إِذَا سَمِعَ الْإِذَانْ كَأَنَّهُ لَا يَعْرِفُنَا Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said that the Prophet sallallahu wasallam used to play with us in, his, in, in the home. Joke and play a normal individual in the home. But when he heard the adhan, it was as if we were complete strangers. He didn't even know who we were. Because he would go and make wudu and ignore everybody and go to the masjid. There's some people who when they go into the salah, Allahu Akbar, they find that their hearts are motivated, inspired. So you got to find your niche. What is easy for you to do? What do you find that your heart is mostly motivated by? Ma yuharrik kalbak. What moves your heart? What motivates your heart? But get up and do something. Get up and engage in some form of ibadah, some form of worship. But the Prophet Sallallahu used to encourage the Sahaba بِغَيْرِ azima Without imposing on them any particular act of worship to do, he would leave that for them to decide. Such a wise leader. He would leave that for them to decide what was easy for them to do it. What, what was easy for them to do. And he would say, مَنْ قَامَ رَمَضَانِ إِيمَانٍ وَاحْتِسَابٍ غُفِلَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِ That whoever stands during the nights in Ramadan, Iman and wahtisabin, having full iman and desiring your reward from Allah, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbi, then he will be forgiven for all of his past sins. And to ensure that the Prophet ﷺ caught Layla to Qadr, the night of power, the Prophet ﷺ would perform what is known as i'tikaf. He will perform something called i'tikaf. And that is that you seclude yourself in the masjid. And although the masajid are closed now, you can seclude yourself in your own home. You are secluded in your home. So you are doing it to calf, basically. But to be even more specific, to make sure that you put yourself in a particular place in your home so that you are able to get up and engage in acts of worship. Abdullah ibn Amr, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, qala anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana ya'taqifu, kana ya'taqifu ashr al-awakhir min Ramadan, wa qala nafi' wa qad arani Abdullah al-makana al-ladhi that Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, 
He said that the Prophet Sallallahu during the last 10 nights of Ramadan, he would perform what is called I'tikaf, where he would seclude himself in the masjid. And Nafia said that Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, who was a Sahabi, Nafia was a Tabi'i, one of the top students of uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Umar. Uh, he said that Abdullah showed me the exact place where the Prophet Sallallahu used to perform I'tikaf at in the masjid. Can you imagine? Can you imagine going to the Prophet's masjid now and knowing the exact place where the Prophet Sallallahu sat and performed I'tikaf? Where he slept in the masjid? SubhanAllah. So, a couple of things before we end the khutbah today that we're going to learn. We're going to learn why is it called Laylatul Qadr. We're going to learn what happens Laylatul Qadr. And we're going to understand why we don't know exactly when Laylatul Qadr is. And we're going to learn which nights we should seek out Laylatul Qadr. The first thing is, why is it called Laylatul Qadr? The, the, the danger, the beauty of social media is that we can reach out to everybody. The danger with social media is that everybody has an opinion. That's the danger of social media. Everybody has an opinion and everybody has the freedom to upload and share information, whether it's authentic or unauthentic, whether it's verifiable or not verifiable, whether it's something that came from their own mind, something that they remembered or they thought they heard, or something that they actually can confirm that they actually did hear. That is the danger with social media. And it has Muslims in mass. It has Muslims in mass in utter confusion. For the most part, in utter confusion, especially those who are new converts to Islam. Trying to grab and grasp, you know, the concepts of the religion with being bombarded with so much information. It's called information overload. So Islamic scholars, their responsibility today, I would like to think, would be to simplify the religion in the simplest terms. As Ali radiallahu ta'ala, he said, al in nuqtah that knowledge is one point, very simplistic in nature. And the ignoramuses are the ones who have made knowledge more expansive than what is necessary. Because when ignorant people speak about matters of knowledge, they make mistakes, and then people of knowledge got to come back, explain the point, clarify the mistake, and each and every time the, the walls get wider and wider and wider, when in fact knowledge was just one simple point. Knowledge is this one point, very simplistic. People who are ignorant, who speak about matters of knowledge that they don't have any understanding of. I didn't say they didn't have any knowledge of, I didn't say they didn't have the information. They lack understanding. And they complicate the religion, they complicate understanding the religion more than what is necessary. Why is it called Laylatul Qadr? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil, laylatil qadr. Indeed, we have revealed it. The it, the pronoun here, goes back to the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al Quran. The month of Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed, not to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Quran was not revealed to Prophet Muhammad in Ramadan. The Qur'an was given to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam over a period of 23 years. Intermittently, over a period of 23 years, it was not given to Prophet Muhammad all at one time in Ramadan. It was given to him in bits and pieces, 10 years in Mecca, 13 years in Mecca, 10 years in Medina, over a period of 23 years. So that is not the understanding of the ayat. Allah is not saying that we revealed the Qur'an to Prophet Muhammad in Ramadan. So what is Allah referring to when he says, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an, the month of Ramadan in which the Qur'an was revealed, revealed to Angel Jibreel, taken from the Lohim Mahfud, the preserved tablet that is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and taken from there, given to Angel Jibreel. And Angel Jibreel brought it down to the Prophet sallallahu bits and pieces over a period of 23 years. Understand, not that the Qur'an was revealed to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu in Ramadan. Although Angel Jibreel would come down in Ramadan and review the Qur'an with the Prophet sallallahu but not every ayat that was given to Prophet Muhammad was given to him in Ramadan. And the Qur'an was not revealed all at once for us to say that the Qur'an was given to Prophet Muhammad in Ramadan. This is a very simple understanding that most Muslims, if you 
Ask the average Muslim what is so special about Ramadan. In Ramadan is the month the Quran was revealed. Revealed to who? To Prophet Muhammad. How was the Quran revealed to Prophet Muhammad? Please explain to me, Ya Tayyip. How was the Quran revealed to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when the first ayahs that were given to him were only five? Iqra. The second set of ayahs that were given to him over uh, after some time was Mudathir. Ya Yuhal Mudathir. Kum Fa'andir. These were just bits and pieces, ayats, not even full surahs, at the beginning of Islam. So how can we say the Qur'an was revealed to Prophet Muhammad in Ramadan? In what context? The Qur'an was revealed to Jibreel in Ramadan, taken from the Lohim Mahfuz, given to Angel Jibreel on the night, a specific night in Ramadan, which is Laylatul Qadr, which makes this, this, this night so powerful. So why is it called Laylatul Qadr? Sheikh Muhammad Amin al Shawkiti, he mentions in his tafsir of Dua al Bayan, wa wajhu tasmiyatuha Laylatul Qadr fihi wajhan. He said there's two reasons why it's called Laylatul Qadr. Number one, and the ma'an al Qadr al Sharf wa Rif'a. Kama yakulu al Arab, Fulan dhu Qadr. Yani dhu Rif'a wa Sharf. Kama yakul, kama yakulu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Laylatul Qadri khayru min alfi shahar. The first reason why it's called Laylatul Qadr. Is because the word Qadr in the Arabic language means nobility, honor, status. When you want to say someone is, someone possesses a high status, you say, يعني, قدره, that he has high status. Sahib Qadr, Dhu Qadr. This is an individual of status, of sharf, of honor and dignity, right? We look up to him. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in another ayah, Laylatul Qadri khayru min alfi shahr, because Laylatul Qadr is better than all, uh, than, is better than uh, uh, 83 years. Better than a thousand months. So Laylatul Qadr is called Laylatul Qadr because it is, it has a, a highness over all other nights. It's great. It's, it's a noble night. He said the second reason, that is called Laylatul Qadr. لِأَنَّهَا سُمِيَتْ لَيْلَةُ قَدْرِ لِأَنَّ اللَّهَ يُقَدِّرُ فِيهَا وَقَاعِيَ السِّنَةِ وَيُدُولُ هَذَا تَفْسِيرَ الْأَخِيرِ قَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى إِنَّا أَنْزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةٍ مُبَارَكَةٍ إِنَّا كُنَّا مُنْذِرِينَ فِيهَا يُفْرَقُ كُلُّ أَمْرٍ حَكِيمٍ أَمْرًا مِنْ عِنْدِنَا The second reason why it's called Laylatul Qadr is because uh, this is the night in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees everything that is going to happen for the next year. He takes it from the Lohim Mahfuz and he sends it down with the angels, the scribes that write everything down for execution. Meaning everything that is going to take place for the next year, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala releases it from Lohim Mahfuz, from the preserved tablet and executes it into the earth. That's why it's called Laylatul Qadr. And that is based upon the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Dukhan. Surah Al-Dukhan, ayah number three, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that indeed we have revealed this, this Qur'an here again. Inna anzalnahu. The who here goes back to the Qur'an. That we have revealed this Qur'an fi laylatin mubarakatin in a blessed night. Inna kunna mundirin. That we are mu'allimin. We are the ones to teach people what's going to happen to them. Fiha yufraku kullu amrin hakim. In this night, yufraku kullu amrin hakim. Every wise matter is disseminated that is going to happen for the next year. Amran min indina, meaning that it is already decided. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees that's going to happen to you within the next year has already been decided. It's just now that it's about to be executed. You understand? And Shaykh Al Taymin rahimahullah ta'ala, in his explanation of this, he said, what it means that every wise matter is to, every precise matter is to be disseminated. What that means is that all of creation, their lifestyles, their lifespans have already been decided for them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes from the Lohim Mahfuz, from the preserved tablet, and he executes it year by year by year. He says, so within the next year. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to decree that some people die and some people live. Some people are going to be born. Some people are going to depart from this world. Some people are going to get sick. 
Some people are going to be healthy. Some people are going to get enriched. Some people are going to be impoverished. Some people are going to find success. Other people are going to find misery and, and a lack of success. And all of these affairs have already been decided, but they will be executed in this night for the next year. That is what is meant by Laylatul Tokadam. And to make it even more understandable, the scholars, subhanAllah, they have explained that the Qadr, divine decree, are broken down into four categories. I want you guys, we are getting a lesson. This is not usually how I preach. This is not my normal Jumu'ah. But I understand that there are many Muslims who laid up to Qadr. This whole concept is very confusing. So I want to take the time to at least explain in the most simplest terms that I possibly can muster up so that after this Jumu'ah you walk away with complete clarity about Laylatul Qadr and what it means. There are four different types of Qadr, four different types of divine decree. The first is Al-Qadr Al-Am, is the general decree. And that is the decree that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided 50,000 years before he brought human beings into existence. The first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created was the pen. And he told the pen, Uktub, write. The pen said, what shall I write? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, write. Uktub, kull ma yahsul ila yawm al-qiyamah. Write everything that is going to take place in the earth up until yawm al-qiyamah. Everything. Every time you cough, every time you use the bathroom, every time you give birth, every time someone dies, every time someone is born, every time someone is sick, every time someone loses their breath, every time someone falls unconscious, every little thing that happens to us in this life, all of it has already been written. That is what is called Al-Qadr Al-Am, the general decree. 50,000 years before Allah brought human beings into existence. Then there is what is called Al-Qadr Al-Umri, and that is your life decree. And this is what happens to the fetus when the fetus is 120 days, four months, a month into the second trimester. That fetus, when that fetus reaches 120 days, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends an angel to that fetus, and that angel blows the soul into that fetus, and that fetus becomes a human being. Which why the scholars say that if a woman miscarries before four months, there is no, there's no need for janazah, there's no need for anything because it was not a human being. If she miscarries any time after four months, no matter how small it is, if it fits in the palm of your hand, if the fetus fits in the palm of your hand, it should be buried and a janazah should be prayed over it because it was in fact a human being because it died after the soul was placed into the body. Essentially, we are spiritual beings having a human experience, not human beings having a spiritual experience. Understand your nature. Understand your usul, your foundation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends an angel to blow the soul into that fetus and to write down four things. Biket bi rizqihi. Writes down what your provision is going to come, what's going to come to you in your life. He writes down how long you're going to live, your lifespan. He writes down whether you're going to be successful in this life or otherwise and whether you're going to be from the people of paradise or hellfire. That is what is called Qadr al-Umri. This is your life decree. That happens at 120 days. And then there is the decree, the Qadr al-Sanawi. There's the yearly decree which happens on Laylatul Qadr. Where Allah takes from the Lohin Mahfuz and He executes what is going to take place with the human beings for the next year. Execution. What has been written is already written. Now it's going to be executed. And then there is what is called Qadr al-Yawmi. Every day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees something different for each and every one of us. Every day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees that somebody's going to get tested, somebody's going to be saved from a test. Some days Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to decree that he's going to answer your dua today, he's not going to answer your dua today. This is a qadr al yawmi Every day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees something different for his servants. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Rahman, Kullu yawmin huwa fi sha'in. Every day Allah is working. Every day God is working. Every day Allah is ex ex executing somebody's new circumstance or situation. It has already been written. We're talking about the execution of that, which happens every single day. Some people are going to make dua that Allah cured them. They're going to wake up one morning and they're cured for their sickness. That is the execution of because you did something to bring about the execution of that qadr. You made dua. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to your dua and changed your circumstance. Gave you another qadr. So dua doesn't essentially change the qadr. Dua just brings about, ushers in another qadr that has already been written. Allah decreed that you were going to be sick. He also decreed that if you made dua to him to cure you from the sickness, that he would respond to the, to the, to the dua. So essentially when you make dua and Allah responds, that is also part of the qadr. So dua does not change the qadr. Dua ushers in another qadr that has already been written for you. Nothing changes the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why it's called Laylatul Qadr. And so understand something. What happens on this night, Laylatul Qadr, is very important because it determines what's going to happen to you your next year. So while you're making preparations to do something, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan has already been written for you and now being executed for you. As Imam Shafi rahimahullah ta'ala gave a narration of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending an angel to go take the soul of a woman who was breastfeeding her child. The angel comes to the woman. She's out in the middle of the desert breastfeeding her child. The angel comes up behind her about to take her soul. But the angel feels bad because the angel realizes that this fetus, this, this newborn baby is about to lose its mother. As we covered in the story of Yusuf salam, when Yusuf's mother, Rahil, gave birth to Binyamin, she died while she was still in her uh, postpartum bleeding period. Binyamin never got a chance to suckle from his mother. Benjamin never got a chance to breastfeed from his mother. His mother died while he was, uh, while she was in the postpartum bleeding phase. Subhanallah, it happens. It happens. To Allah we belong, and to Allah we shall return. We don't question God. We don't question Allah Subhanahu wa Taala why He does what He does. Allah says in the Quran, لا يسألوا عما يفعلوا وهم يسألون. God is not to be questioned about what He does, but you will be questioned about what you do. Allah is not to be questioned about what He does. We will be questioned about what we do. He is Al-Malik. He is the King. He is Al-Jabbar. He is the one who sits high and executes his commands unquestioned about what he does, subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is for us to learn how to make peace with God's decision, not question God's decision. You understand? We learn how to make peace with Allah's decision, not question Allah's decision. Why me? Why did he do this? If God exists, why would he do that? If God exists, why would he take my mother? Why would he take my baby brother? It's not for you to question Allah. It's for you to find peace with Allah's decision. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. To Allah we belong and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we return. It's not for us to question. But Imam Shafi said that Allah sends the angel to go take the soul of the woman while she's breastfeeding her child. And the angel lets a tear drop from its eye because the angel realizes that this woman, while making preparations to breastfeed the child and raise the child, she doesn't even realize that her time is up. Her time is up. Then Allah sends the angel to an old man to go collect the soul of an old man. And when the angel comes to this old man, the old man is at the blacksmith store trying to get his cane, you know, restructured, trying to put something at the bottom of the cane to make it sturdy so it can last longer. And the angel begins to smile because the angel looks at the old man who's making preparations to live longer, not even realizing that he only has a few lahavat, he only has a few breaths left before the angel snatches his soul. You only have a few breaths, a few times to breathe more before the angel collects your soul. So what I'm saying that to say is that as Laylatul Qadr takes place, we are making preparation for the next year, but preparation has already been made for us. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allows us to make peace with his decision for us, whether it is good or whether it is bitter. بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن العظيم ونفعني وإياكم بما جاء فيه من الآيات والذكر الحكيم أقول ما تسمعون أستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المؤمنين من كل ذنب فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين the second thing is, why don't we know when Laylatul Qadr is? Why are we seeking Laylatul Qadr in the last 10 nights? Why don't we know emphatically which exact night is Laylatul Qadr? 
There is a wisdom in why the knowledge of Laylatul Qadr was taken away from us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to meet, meet him in the best, in our best state. Having pushed ourselves to our limit, to our max. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to meet him in our best state. So he places a few obstacles, a few challenges in our lives. Because what doesn't challenge you won't change you. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us exactly when Laylatul Qadr is, we would be lazy all the way up until the night that we believe is Laylatul Qadr. So by removing the knowledge of Laylatul Qadr, it forces us to exert ourselves a little bit more, to push ourselves a little bit more, because we don't know which night it is. We don't know which night it is. So while we're thinking about, oh, it's tonight an odd night, it's tomorrow an odd night, Forget whether tonight is an odd night or tomorrow is an odd night. If you are mujtahid, if you are doing your due diligence for the whole 10 nights, you ain't got to worry about whether tonight is an odd night or not. You don't have to worry about that because you know that you exert yourself to the best of your ability every single night. As they said about Sufyan al one of the great scholars of Hadith, that if death came to him, lo ja'ahu al if death came to him, ma mastata'a an yazid. He would not have the ability to do any more than what he was already doing. He lived his life to the max. He was always at 10 in his ibadah. Always at 100. Always functioning at 100. So even if death came to him, you know how sometimes a person is on their deathbed and they know they're about to die, then they want to start doing better and want to start doing more because they know they're about to die. They said that Sufyan Athodi was such that if death came to him at any given moment, he wouldn't have the ability to do any more than what he was already doing because he was already at full capacity. He was already functioning at the maximum state of spirituality. Constantly. And I get it, for many of us, that's a struggle. But this is where jihad and nafs, this is where self-struggle comes in. When do you start struggling with yourself, struggling against yourself? We constantly say, I'm trying, I'm doing my best. Are you really? Are you really doing your best? Or is that just something that we say to back people off of us? Is that just another deflective measure I'm deflecting. I want to move. I want to maneuver away from being cornered and the spotlight being put on me. So I say, well, I'm doing my best. <laughs> Are you really? And for all of us, there's room for improvement. For every single one of us, there's room for improvement. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed the knowledge of Laylatul Qadr from us. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, it was mentioned in the hadith of Ubad ibn Samit. Who said, خرج النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ليخبرنا بليلة القدر Ubad ibn Usama said that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم came out one day to tell us when Layla al-Qadr was. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم received revelation from Allah and came out one day to come inform us when Layla al-Qadr was. So that means that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم did actually know which day Layla al-Qadr was. He came out to inform the Muslims on which day Laylatul Qadr was? فَتَلَاحَ رَجُلَانِ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And two men got into an argument as the Prophet ﷺ was walking to the center of the city to call everybody to inform them. He passed by two men arguing with one another, fighting with one another. And so the Prophet ﷺ jumped in to stop the two men from hurting each other. And in the midst of trying to help them solve their issue, he forgot. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed the knowledge of Laylatul Qadr. And then the Prophet ﷺ got on the minbar and he said, Qadr. I came out to inform you all when Laylatul Qadr was. Fulan wa fulan he said, but so and so and so and so got into a fight. And in the midst of me trying to break up their fight, I forgot. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed the knowledge of Laylatul Qadr. And perhaps that is better for you. Look at the optimism of the Prophet ﷺ. Even though knowledge was taken away from him, he still saw in that situation, was still optimistic that perhaps it's better for you that you don't know. He didn't fret over something. And I want you to look at that in that moment. I want us to look at that in that moment. That's called resilience. That's called being optimistic. That in the midst of something bad happening, you still find something good that can come out of it. The collateral beauty that comes out of it. He said, perhaps it's good for you. Who has something taken away from them and then kind of looks at the situation objectively and says, 
or maybe it was a good thing it was taken away from me. That's called objectivity. That's called optimism. <laughs> who, who does that? Who had you go outside and you see that your car smashed up, somebody sideswiped your car, and now you got to call a tow truck to come and take your car away from you. And the whole while you complaining, who would sideswipe my car? I hate people, blah, 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 to the end of it. And then you jump in an Uber and you go to work. But you never stop to think that perhaps that happened saving you from a bigger accident. Perhaps you put your keys in your car and you pulled off that morning and by the time you got to the stop sign and you pulled off, you, another car hits you head on and you go flying through the front windshield. And perhaps that situation of your car being side swipe and you gotta have your car told so you can have it looked at and examined, perhaps that was saving you from something else. But it takes optimism to really think about it like that. It takes objectivity of your life to sit back and say, oh, if there might be some wisdom in that. So in that very moment, the Prophet ﷺ said, I came out to inform you when Laylatul Qadr was. And so and so and so and so got into a fight. And in the midst of me trying to break up their fight, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed the knowledge of it. He said, and perhaps it's better for you. Perhaps it's better for you that you don't know. And then he said, uh, he said, so seek Laylatul Qadr in the 29th night or in the 27th night or the 25th night, meaning the odd nights. So now you know why we don't know what Laylatul Qadr is. And this, I want to draw, I want to hone in on a point here. And that is that the danger of differing, the danger, it's evil. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he would to go perform hajj. And Uthman radiallahu anhu, it was from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to uh, Yom al the, the first, the, the eighth day of the hijjah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when they got to, uh, to Mina, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would shorten his prayer. Some scholars say that he would pray them, he would pray Dhuhr and Asr, you know, the, at their time, but shorten them. And some say he would pray them, you know, uh, at their time, uh, without shortening them. Nonetheless, Uthman, he used to pray all four. He wouldn't shorten. That was his own ijtihad. That was his own way of seeing it. I, I'm, I'm not a traveler, but I don't mind strengthening, you know, I don't mind praying four. I don't want to, you know, and believe it or not, Uthman, as well as Aisha, as well as Abu Huraira, and many, many of the Sahaba, when they traveled, they didn't shorten their prayers. That was from their own ijtihad. They were scholars in their own right, but that was the way that they saw it. They saw that it wasn't a burden for them to pray for. So they would pray for. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he came on Hajj with some of the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, and they said, well, we saw you pray two raka'ah, but Uthman prays four. Pay attention how people try to get you caught up as a scholar, as an imam. They'll come to you and they'll say, well, so-and-so said so-and-so. So-and-so said such and such. So they went to Ibn Mas'ud and they said, you know, you pray too, but Uthman, when he comes to make Hajj, he prays for. Why don't you go advise Uthman that the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu is to pray too? And uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, nah, leave him as he is. He said, shar. He said, because differing is evil. Leave him. He wants to pray for, let him pray for. But I'm not going to go differ with him because differing is evil. And I want us to understand that in our ummah. In our, as African American Muslims, our situation, because we have been so accustomed to fighting and being on defense our entire lives, that we have been consumed by war. As the Prophet Sallallahu said about Quraysh, he's trying to make peace with them. They want to keep fighting. He said, Enna Quraysh kad akalahum al harb. That Quraysh has been consumed by war. All they want to do is fight. As Maslow's hammer theory, if you a hammer, then perhaps everything that you see is a nail and you treat it as such. You solve every single problem the same exact way, every single time, without using any wisdom. Just fight, 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 argue, differ, bicker. I want to be right. You're wrong. When do we move past this? When do we elevate past this? When do we evolve and mature past this? I want to be right and you're wrong. Okay, you're right. Got it. Can we move on? <laughs> Can we move on? You're right. You're smarter. You know more of the sunnah. You're more Salafi than I am. You know you have a greater relationship with the scholars than I do. Got it. Salamna. I submit to that. Can we move on? Because as long as there's war, there's no progress. You, those of us who spent time in the streets, you know you can't 
you can't fight and make money at the same time. You got to choose your battle. Either you're a hustler and you're going to make money and you're going to try to avoid situations that bring about drama or you're just a fiend for drama and you ain't going to never make no money. You're going to always be broke. You're going to always be broke because you can't fight and make money at the same time. You can't bicker and fight and turn whole entire communities upside down just to prove that you're right and then expect us to have progress as a ummah. Expect us to have progress as a community. It's not going to happen. Al khilaf shar differing is evil. Look at what it has done to our communities. Look at what it has done to our imams. So so much potential that we have. But akalahum al harb we have been consumed by war. That's all we want to do is fight. All we want to do is prove who's right and who's wrong. And align ourselves with those who agree with us. And separate and distance ourselves from those who don't agree with us. We ain't going to never go anywhere. And we ain't going to never have anything. You can't have progress and war at the same time. Which is why the Prophet Wasallam signed the peace treaty. Sulh al-Hudaybiyah signed the peace treaty with, the, with Quraysh. Ten years no fighting. And in that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called that peace treaty. Although it seemed like the Muslims took the lower end of the stick, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Al-Fatih, the, the chapter of the victory. Inna fatahna laka fatah al -mubina. We have given you a clear manifest victory. Why was the signing of that peace treaty a victory? Because you can put your differences to the side and you can spread Islam. More people converted to Islam in that short period of time than ever in the history of the Prophet's time in Medina. He got a chance to put Quraysh on ice, ice them. And ice wasn't by continuously fighting. Because if you fight your enemy long enough, eventually you're going to lose. But Khilaf Shar, differing is evil. And that was one of the reasons why. Unfortunately, the knowledge of Laylatul Qadr was taken from us. But as the Prophet ﷺ said, seek Laylatul Qadr in the odd nights. And some scholars say even in the even nights. And I'm saying that if you are mujtahid, that if you are diligent in every night from the last 10 nights of Ramadan, then you ain't got nothing to worry about. You have nothing to worry about. Stop focusing on if this is an odd night, if tonight is an odd night. Yes, tonight is an odd night. Tonight is the 23rd night. Tonight is an odd night. But what, so then what did that mean last night? You did nothing last night? You didn't engage in any form of worship last night? Nothing? Because it was an even night? La wallahi. We're going to engage in ibadah every night. <laughs> every night. We're going to do something. We might exert ourselves a little bit more on, on the odd nights, but we're going to exert ourselves every night. Afala akunu abdin shakura, as the Prophet Sallallahu response to Aisha, should we not be grateful servants? Should I not be a grateful servant? Look at all of what Allah has blessed us with. We're in the comfort of our own homes with our families, praying with our families, breaking fast with our families, spending days with our families, cleaning our homes, you know, doing our gardens, doing everything that, you know, I mean, like this, this is a blessing. <laughs> As Allah says, لا تحسبوه شر لكم بل هو خير لكم. Don't consider this an evil thing for you. Consider this a good thing. And so we have how we can find it. Um, I was going to go into some of the signs The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said The sign of Laylatul Qadr is that the night The morning of Laylatul Qadr uh, That the sun will rise without any rays That's just, just a sign But here again It doesn't really matter Because if you exerted yourself Then you have nothing but to hope for good And as Muslims we live between fear and hope Regardless <laughs> Regardless our lives fluctuate between these two periods Or these two states of hope And uh Fear and hope. And we fear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't accept anything from us, even if we stood Laylatul Qadr. And we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts from us, even if we didn't have the ability to stand for Laylatul Qadr. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنًا وَقِنَا عَذَابِ النَّارِ اللهم إنا نسألك الحودة والتقى وعالفاف والغناء اللهم أصلح لنا ديننا الذي هو عصمة أمرنا وأصلح لنا دنيانا التي فيها معاشنا وأصلح لنا آخر آخرة آخرة التي فيها معادنا وجعل الحياة زيادة لنا في كل خير وجعل الموت راحة لنا 
راحة لنا من كل شر برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو كريم تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وآخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وأقيم الصلاة